Welcome back to my full ranking of yada yada yada, you get the drill. This time we're looking at the actual good W areas in the series. But first, we gotta finish the decent here, so let's get to it. Inner Ward is like a condensed version of the Gates of Boletaria. It's shorter, more linear, shares most of the enemies, but thanks to the army of archers, tight corridors and streets chock full of enemies, it's an appropriate increase in challenge from what came before. It also has ninjas who feel like a prototype for what we'd eventually get in Elden Ring with the Black Knife Assassins. The only part I really don't enjoy is when you're approaching the area's boss, Penetrator. Only it's you who's going to experience triple penetration. There's Three dick suckers, right next to one another, along with a plethora of archers. You can load them in one by one with a bow at least, but I'd rather not have to walk around annoying enemy placements. But even though this place doesn't have much of its own unique flavors and is just a continuation of Boletaria, I find the gameplay up until the trio of torture to be pretty exciting. It's a good test of what you've learned so far. Pretty much everything I've ever seen people say about the Ritual Path has been negative. 4-2 is just long descent on narrow pathways with boring encounters and suddenly snails. Ouch. I mean, technically it's true, but what's being left out is how fucking cool it is. You have literal Grim Reapers summoning countless lanky ghosts who slowly walk towards you and sure, they're easily dispatched by either killing them one by one or just offing the Reapers. But seeing these translucent figures wandering around is kinda creepy. And in terms of colors, I think this area is gorgeous. It takes place mostly inside these gloomy, damp catacombs and they're contrasted beautifully with all the greenish, bluish colors. The liquid, the enemies and their beams are all similarly cyan. And the little slug cave is just... Mwah! It's so good! But yes, as a run back to the boss, should you die, it's awful. There's approximately zero shortcuts. And dodging those beams in narrow pathways is like actually impossible. But it is Demon Souls, so what are you doing dying to a boss? So if there's any fellow Ritual Path enjoyers out there, let me know, because when I searched for like-minded individuals online, the closest result was Ritual Path is just the worst. Continuing our Demon Souls streak is Smithing Grounds, which is such a unique feeling area, even to this day. You're given hints of a much larger world when you look to the distance to see faraway structures and cities in this alien planet-looking desert. I kinda wish we got a little more of it, because most of your time is spent exploring a less fascinating mine, factory or whatever the fuck, full of semi-annoying enemies, depending on your weapon. I hear they're weak to magic and thrust, yet when I tried this weapon, it didn't really do anything. If anything, they seem to like it. But usually I go grab the Crescent Falchion early on, but doing this area on my first playthrough with nothing but the Claymore wasn't really the best experience. But as far as level progression and design goes, Smithing Grounds is a rare W for Demon Souls. There's actual shortcuts in here, and you reveal the path forward by dissolving lava with water. I'm not sure that's how it would really work, but whatever. Just like the shutting grounds of Elden Ring, the Depths is a labyrinth in the form of a miserable, dark sewer system full of rats, basilisks and other nasties. So why is the Depths an entire tier higher? Well, unlike in the shutting grounds, I actually find getting lost in the Depths to be enjoyable, and I'm not really sure why. It feels less like an inconvenience and more like part of the exploration. If you go the wrong way, you don't really miss out on anything, it usually loops back around. Whereas going the wrong way in shunning rounds often left me more frustrated than anything. But plenty of you guys do really like shunning rounds, and I can see why, because I get the same enjoyment out of the depths. I'm still keeping it out of the good tier though, because none of the enemies here do it for me. And yes, I did get cursed by the basilisks on my first playthrough. And yes, it did suck. Royal Wood is Darkroot Garden before it became dark, and is instead bright and littered with gardeners and stone guardians, who kinda work as a prototype for many strong enemy types to come in the rest of the series. So I appreciate them for that, and for the fact that they're pretty cool on their own. On top of that, it has Calamite stalking you, the Abyss creeping in from below, which is actually physically connected to Chasm of the Abyss, and that's really nice. But I can't quite convince myself that Royal Wood is a truly good tier deserving area, because it's just a wide forest with enemies scattered around wherever. I mostly just run past this area to get to Artorias, but if I do decide to look around, it does have pretty nice ambience. But that about does it for decent here. I'm happy. In terms of atmosphere, aesthetics and a general location in the world, I love Ulusil Township. 
probably my favorite looking place in Dark Souls 1. I love areas that are in their own way beautiful, but also gloomy and foreboding, and that becomes more and more apparent as you go further into the town and discover the influence of the Abyss. I just wish we got way more of it. It's such a brief level. Then again, if expanding it meant more Ulusil residents, maybe I'd have to pass. There's pretty much just two enemies throughout this entire area, besides a couple mimics and the strange chained up mess at the end, which is cool. But other than that, it's either Ooga Booga Monkey Guy or Annoying Giggling Spellcaster, and they're an awful combo with their insanely high damage. At the very least, the level design is pretty decent, and I like how vertical it is, and it's got some cleverly placed loot throughout. Even though I honestly think Dark Souls 3 has the weakest early game in the series, even including Dark Souls 2, the very first level besides the tutorial is a good one. It introduces you to easy soldiers, guys who can alert nearby soldiers and should be killed quickly, Lothric knights which are great, and has a couple tough sons of bitches to test you, including a fat angelic knight and the pussy of man. They're annoying to fight, but I like the surprise factor, as well as the fact that it follows the theme of Yurex Gandu, second phase. The dragon is kinda ass as an obstacle though, even if it does add some coolness factor for new players. I guess they just wanted to keep the intro dragon tradition alive, but I'd rather it stay dead. I think this comment sums up the problems pretty well, but it's a long one, so I'll speedrun it. I think Highball of Lothric is just boring to be honest. It's very uninspired in terms of look or even gimmick, which to be fair is a problem with a lot of the game I feel. In terms of level design, sure there is quite a bit to explore, but the bonfire placements show how kinda messy it can get. One central that is meant to be used with the help of a shortcut, but also one of the tower thing because the game frontloads a lot of stuff at the beginning which doesn't loop into anything and is more of a ah, uh, gotcha thing. It doesn't have the design clarity of something like Central Yarnum or hell even Undead Settlement, which loops back on itself nicely and has a lot more visual and gameplay variety I feel. That sounds fair to me, but I do still kinda like Highwall of Lothric, enough to put it in good. I remember when the Ringed City DLC came out and I thought Dreckheap was the Ringed City, and I didn't feel super let down. Then we got the real Ringed City and everyone forgot Dreckheap exists. But I think the first half of it deserves to be remembered. It looks insanely cool, one of the best end of the world settings I've seen. And I like how much you drop down further and further from impossible heights. As far as enemies go, it has decently fun headless heralds and jump scare humanity monsters. It's enjoyable to play, up until the angels show up. They're nowhere near as bad as they were on launch day, but I don't know, is it really fun to deal with them, thralls and a poison swamp at the same time? Which by the way is Harvest Valley from Dark Souls 2. I don't really think so. The one area to make a return from Dark Souls 2 and it of course had to be a poison fucking area. Thanks Dark Souls 2. You might be questioning the high regard I have for Upper Cathedral Ward, seeing as it's just a short, dark level with wolf beasts and brain suckers everywhere. And it's a good reason to question it. If this place didn't have the atmosphere it has, it would probably be in the mediocre tier. But that atmosphere is enough for me to elevate it this far up, because Jesus Christ this place was so creepy and alluring when I first discovered it. As soon as you enter it, you're greeted by alien slug babies and one of the coolest views in the game. Now uh, look at those trees in the sky! I'm having an aesthetical orgasm here. Not to mention the background music which makes venturing into the darkness of the orphanage all the more tense. Great level? Maybe not. Memorable moment? Absolutely. Einstall River is kind of like Ashina Depths where it goes all over the place in terms of theme, beginning as a disgusting ant cave before revealing some ancient ruins guarded by the slowest moving enemies I've ever fought. Besides that one time I broke into a nursing home. But let, let's not talk about that. But the most notable destination in Einsel River is, of course, Lake of Rot. What a beautiful, fun area and worthy of all the hardships you've faced thus far to reach. Oh, and there's also Eternal City, Noxtella. I guess it's kind of cool. I really love this area thematically all throughout, even beginning from the Ant Cave, but as a level, it's very linear. I wish the caves were more like the depths in their design, a place you could truly get lost in. It could be a memorable, disgusting experience. Kinda like my sex life. Noxtella is also not the most interesting level design wise, but I really enjoy it. I think the Nox ladies are brilliant and there's a great variety of them. They use extendable swords and maces and can ride on top of ants. And also BALLS! But I think what really tips it over to being a good tier area is how much I enjoy the exploration. This place just gives a great sense of adventure, even if it is overshadowed by how much cooler Sciofer River is. We are three videos into this ranking series and this is only the third Sekiro area I've included thus far. 
and one of them wasn't really even a real area. I guess that speaks volumes of how consistent I think Sekiro's area quality is. Oshina Outskirts is a slow warm-up for the rest of the game, which it definitely benefits from as it's a wholly different combat system and you'll need some practice to get used to it. And for that you have ideally easy enemies that still encourage you to play by the new rules. There's slowly soldiers who you can just R1 spam, guys who tend to be passive and block, whom you can kill with a thrust attack, then there are others who will deflect you and strike back and they're good for forcing you to block or deflect. Then you come across a mini boss I still find semi-challenging to this day, but I never found it frustrating dying to him on my first playthrough. I saw it as a trial by fire, and it worked. By the time I was done with Ashina Outskirts, I was much better at the game. But is it perfect? No. There isn't much to say when it comes to the level design, and it has a pretty crappy tutorial for grabs. This troll mini boss who has near instant grab and unforgiving hitboxes. The sections that encourage stealth are also not my favorite because you don't have any good tools for stealth at this point, so you're just slowly crouching around. I like the giant snake though, he's basically there to let you know that this game will have its fantasy elements in place from time to time. It's a complete face roll to bypass now, but it sure did leave an impression on me back then. Oh, and you come back here at the very end of the game when Ashina is under attack. Personally, I really like the changes they did to make it feel fresh again. There's fire everywhere, you progress the level backwards, and the Ministry soldiers are fucking badass looking on top of being good enemies. Maybe part of the reason I was really impressed by Drang Lake Castle on my first playthrough was because, well, the previous areas were what they were. When I look at the different sections on their own, are they really all that great? Mostly not really. But the castle does look really nice, I love the rain and the look of the place. Makes it almost cozy when you get inside. I also think the enemies being blended in with the statues is cool, makes you wary of all of them and you never know which one's real and which one isn't. I like the mechanic of killing enemies near giant statues to unlock doors, but the one room at the bottom of the castle is a bit questionable. If you do it all in one go, it's fine, but if you reset by resting at a bonfire, all the doors remain open and suddenly you're getting torn apart by a million rune sentinels. Other than that, there aren't many annoying enemy gauntlets and ganks, it's mostly a pretty chill stroll through an eerily empty castle. I don't think it's a great tier deserving area, as the level design is far from the best, and there isn't that much to explore, and a lot of its sections are forgettable. At first I found Forest of Fallen Giants to be a pretty bland place, but it does have some neat backstory with the War of the Giants. It's still kinda boring in terms of art style, but it makes up for it by having top tier level design. This is just classic Souls level design, it wouldn't be out of place in the first half of Dark Souls 1. That's tall praise. There's tons to explore, lots of paths that loop around, shortcuts and non-linear layout. And as for enemies, I don't really have anything to complain about and that's a rare thing to say for Dark Souls 2 areas. I don't have anything to praise about them either, they're just generic fodder aside from the surprise pursuer encounter. You could argue this place deserves to be in the great tier, but I'm saving that tier for areas I really really enjoy. I believe Lost Bastille deserves way more praise than it gets. As a level I think it's just better than Drang Lake Castle in almost every way, besides looks. Even then, I do like the moonlit setting. I think what's great about Bastille is how open-ended it is. You can access the level from either Forest of Fallen Giants or No Man's Wharf, both of which take you to pretty much the opposite sides of the fortress, and neither is the correct or wrong way to approach the area. You could spend hours in this place and still miss out on a lot of its secrets and hidden paths, so it's an explorer's wet dream, but personally I'd rather not spend longer than about an hour in here. I don't get much out of the enemy encounters. They're either boring enemies but copy-pasted 10 times in one spot to make it challenging, or they're just nothing, you just walk up to them and kill them. It's still a good area of course, I'm not bringing up these complaints to shit on it, but rather to justify why it's not in the highest tiers. Sunken Valley is a similar area to Noxtilla and Ashina Depths. It's a linear adventure through greatly differing scenarios, but in Sunken Valley's case, I think it's pretty damn good every step of the way. You're leaving the luxuries of the massive castle and plunge into snowy caverns full of riflemen of some mountain clan. The first set piece in here is the notorious gun fort, which people either really love or absolutely despise. This time I'm not in the middle because I really like it. I think it's a great change of pace from the core gameplay. It's an interesting scenario, a heavily armed fort full of snipers that you must approach from below while dodging a hail of bullets, which you then sneak into and take the snipers out one by one. Only there are traps all over the fort which will alert enemies should you step on them. I think they did a good job with the enemy placements and it feels satisfying to clear out flawlessly. After that your journey takes you into a second encounter with the giant snake, which is much more brief this time, but hey, it's fucking Jormungandr, it's cool to see. Right after that you enter a massive valley with a monkey hive at the top and a poison swamp at the bottom. 
If this counts as a poison area, then technically I think Sunken Valley is the best one. It's not a problem at all to avoid the poison, it's optional, and it has one of the scariest enemies to fight in the series. Should give the title of Sword Saint to these fucking monkeys, they're harder than Ishin! Or you can just stealth kill them. There's also a third encounter with the snake inside this spoopy cave full of g-g-g-g-g-ghosts. I think all of these set pieces follow the same pattern of not being necessarily amazing in terms of level design and encounters, but each of them is memorable. By far the hardest area for me to rank in this entire video series is Helic Tree and Elf Isle. And yes, I'm combining the two. Deal with it. They'd be back to back anyway. Thing is, both sections have some incredible highs, but also horrible lows. It starts out rather nasty atop some narrow branches, which makes gravity the number one threat here, and I very rarely enjoy that. It's decently well made in its layout, but I just don't like the anxiety. But the following little town is fucking beautiful. It reminds me so much of like a Lord of the Rings elf city. It's so serene, and then it has misbegotten everywhere, who you've probably seen in just about every corner of the world so far. I think they're fine, especially the Leonai misbegotten ultra chads. It's just that it would have been nice to see this completely unique, fascinating area introduce something equally as interesting in its inhabitants. I do still like it. Elfile, on the other hand, starts off really promising. It has plenty of fun enemies, even if they're also familiar by now, such as Clean Rot Knights, who are excellent. It's got an interesting layout that differs from all the other similar cities like Laindel. It's a crescent-shaped set of walls full of verticality. It had so much potential to be an amazing tier area, but then it has possibly my most hated enemy gauntlets ever in the series. No joke, the part with Ballistas, two elite knights and a putrid avatar is so obnoxious and bullshit. I don't know what the fuck they were thinking. It feels like you're meant to skip it by sneaking in above them, but there's loot incentive and the option to summon spirit ashes, so I think they meant this to be beatable. Which it is, but not without a considerable amount of bullshittery. And the bottom level has spammed revenants, but that's mild compared to the enemy placements to follow. There's putrid crystallians in a tiny, tiny little room, kindreds of rot in a scarlet swamp, and a garden full of more kindreds on one side and soldiers on the other. Neither is worth clearing out. If they had dedicated as much time to Helictree as they had to Lanedale, I could see this being a top 10 worthy area. I really want to love this area. It's among the coolest Dark Souls 2 areas, which might not say much, but it really is cool. It's a giant factory tower mixed with Mount Vesuvius' eruption aftermath. One of the weaknesses of Dark Souls 2 area designs was the lack of interior detail, but I find the lack of it works for Broom Tower because it's an industrial complex, why would it be decorated? If you removed like half the enemies in the area, it would probably be great tier material. It's a neat structure with tons of diverging paths and secrets. It's the least bit linear and rewards exploration without forcing it, unlike a certain other DLC area. But some of the enemy encounters here are complete garbage. They introduce these headless giants by having one surrounded by an army of soldiers and an ashen idol buffing them all. It seems the idea was to use these little guys with explosive barrels, but that plan just blew up in their faces. They're just annoying and janky to hurt, and it's too hectic to do in the middle of a combat scenario. Most likely you'll just wind up killing yourself. It's the worst example of a terrible gank in this area, but it's not the only one. And the ashen idols are kind of a trash gimmick. If you could just destroy them by hitting them once or twice with a weapon, that would be okay. But why have it consume key items you have limited amount of? Especially when you need those to stop Fumnaut from healing himself. So when I say rewarding exploration, this is not what I mean, this is punishing exploration. There are times when this area is brilliant, like when you get the elevators working, or when you walk across the chains and take in the scenery. I also think the enemies are better than average, particularly the dudes passively leaking lava from left to right. But then every once in a while there's terribly designed rooms. So I think Broom Tower being right here with a helix tree is appropriate. Both are so close to excellence, it hurts. The Academy of Rhea Lucaria is a really good level, if you just ignore the fact that it's a magic academy. Because that premise alone makes me so excited to explore it. But none of the good things in this area have to do with whimsical magic. The main path is fairly linear and obvious though it does look amazing. Really, this place looks like Hogwarts, so please give us more of it, and less of the graveyard with zombies. I feel like this exact same area exists in every zone in Elden Ring, pretty much. But there's very little magic to be seen here. The main enemies mostly just spam glintstone pebbles, which is like the weakest offensive spell in the game. How did these guys get accepted into the fucking academy? Did they reallocate their points away from intellect? They should hire the elite battle mages from Helic Tree. There's just an endless possibility with a magical school, and I really wish they had gone all out with it. 
Just go crazy, have it be a ridiculous level that makes no logical sense. It's still good as just a normal level, but what makes it top of good tier for me is the rooftops. It took me like 7 playthroughs to even find this, I think I should be legally blind. But as soon as I did, I was amazed. It was so cool to jump from roof to roof and explore it all, and it goes on for quite a while, and loops back to earlier sections. Again, it has nothing to do with magic, it's just a neat level. I guess to get my fix I'm gonna have to buy Hogwarts Legacy. I'm combining Great Hollow as part of Ash Lake, which is lucky for the big tree, because it wouldn't make it past the mediocre tier on its own. It's the ultimate platforming level in this game, and I hate thoroughly exploring it. Thankfully, if your only goal is to reach the bottom, it's not too bad. And it does still enhance the Ash Lake experience, because it helps create one of the best area transitions I've ever seen. This tucked away corner of the world is hidden behind a couple invisible walls at the bottom of Blight Town of all places, and I am so envious of people who discovered it by chance. It's a serene otherworldly place underneath the horrors above, and sure, as a level it's not comparable to intricately designed castles full of diverging paths and secrets. But Ash Lake doesn't need to be. It is the diverging path, it is the secret. I have great admiration for hidden areas that have a lot of effort put in them. Most game developers wouldn't take the chance of the majority of players missing out on it, but FromSoft revels in it. Even though I know Ash Lake doesn't lead to anything all that worthwhile, I still often end up visiting the place just because I like the calmness of it. The ambience and the world building is so enjoyable, even when I'm getting murdered by a flying hydra. I think I've just talked myself into making Ash Lake our first great tier area. Even though on paper Lothric Castle is just an extension of Hyrule of Lothric with barely any new enemies in it, it's got some of the best enemy placements in the game. They're placed much smarter with archers, bomb throwers and differently behaving enemies and ganks. Not all ganks are bad after all, even if Dux has too nearly convinced me of it. But having some be more aggressive and others passive works better than just copy pasting the same enemy 5 times in one small room. Lothric Castle is like a better inner ward. Plus there's a really cool new skybox and a ton of Lothric Knights. If it wasn't for these guys, who knows how Elden Ring's knight enemies would have turned out. They are a perfect template which gave us some of the best enemies in the series, and even the base version of them in Dark Souls 3 is still pretty damn good. The dragon obstacle is also an improvement over what we had in Highwall. Instead of being a green and red light simulator, it's more like a gate you need to unlock by circling around the level. As soon as you attack the goo seeping from their claws, both dragons die instantly and now you've essentially unlocked a shortcut. It's not the most breathtaking, unique level in the game, but gameplay-wise it's great. The mood in Darkroot Garden is unparalleled even to this day. It might have shitty textures, but it's a showcase of art style aging better than graphics. It just has such thick atmosphere, I almost feel like I can smell it. It's gloomy, mysterious, and in a way beautiful. The illuminating flowers give this place so much life, even if they do always trick me into thinking they're loot. It's also an extremely varied level. The path to Moonlight Butterfly is a linear one, with living shrubberies appearing every so often, as well as having the bullshit stone knights. I recommend just making sure you can do enough damage to kill them before they can cast a spell that prevents you from rolling. The last thing we need is a portable Swamp of Sorrow. But when it comes to differing paths and secrets, very few can compete with Darkroot Garden. There's a secret path behind a living tree that has these weird frog creatures that aren't seen anywhere else in the game. There's also more open forests that are inhabited by a wide assortment of enemies. There's NPC assassins, giant cats who have killed me more times than any of the actual bosses in this place, and some adorable mushroom people. I just love seeing them walk around. Darkroot Basin is kind of included in this, but I mean, it's kind of trash. It has the annoying Hydra and the equally as annoying intro quest to the DLC, but I'm not gonna let it drag down the fondness I have for the rest of this wonderful location. Cathedral of the Deep is the one little bit of fun you can experience in between Road of Sacrifices, Faroon Keep and Catacombs of Carthus, and it single-handedly almost saves the first half of Dark Souls 3 for me, if only it ended on a worthwhile boss. I also have some bad memories of my first playthrough and subsequent Soul Level 1 challenge runs because it has teleporting dogs and a long stretch before your first checkpoint. They were really determined to make this whole area revolve around a single bonfire, and mostly it works, it's just a bit rough at first. But the Cathedral is fucking cool. It's one of the few visually pleasing areas in the early game, not just because of the bluish and red interiors, but even the outskirts look pretty nice. There's lots of gameplay variety with a maze of respawning maggot zombies, kamikaze hollows and rooftops, but I'm kinda left wanting a little more from the actual cathedral. The time spent there is enjoyable, mostly, I never liked the giants, but the cathedral knights are fun, the maggot people are appropriately disgusting, 
and it has one of the scariest enemies in the series. But the centerpiece of it is a massive empty hall. It looks gorgeous, I just wish it had better gameplay than diarrhea pawns and thralls. But I think there's just enough side rooms to make the cathedral satisfying enough. I wish we had more massive structures with interiors like this. By this point it's probably clear I'm a fan of Bloodborne areas, but even with that in mind, I think my placement of Kanehurst is a fair bit lower than the average Bloodborne players. It's a beloved destination, it's snowy and spooky, but also ornate and clean, and it's a stark contrast to everything else in Bloodborne. Instead of dealing with a beast plague and aliens, you're traversing a vampire castle full of ghosts. It's a perfect secret area and it's wonderful to discover. For all that, I'm in agreement that it's great. The only thing to hold it back from being amazing in my eyes is the lack of good enemies and a sprawling layout. It's got almost no secret paths to discover whatsoever, and the ghosts don't really put up a fight at all, and after a while I just want them to shut the fuck up. Stop crying! Shut up! It's still a great detour to take, especially when timed with the second half of Bloodborne's main game that has otherwise less fun areas. In contrast to my lower than usual ranking of Kanehurst, I know for a fact most wouldn't place Forbidden Woods anywhere near this high. I swear, I'm not being a contrarian for the sake of being a contrarian. We all have our hot takes every once in a while, and I'm fine with this being one of mine. I think this is the best forest area FromSoft has made. You can actually feel like you're lost in the woods here, particularly in the second half. But before that you're wandering around in a trap central consisting of just your basic Yanamites, though the traps are pretty sweet, I must admit. And I'm a fan of how there is a side path that leads all the way back to the very start of the game. And it's not just for the sake of showing off, but it unlocks more of that earlier area to explore. But what elevates the first, more or less decent half? is the snake twist. Suddenly it's a Resident Evil game and you're frantically trying to find your way around twisted looking scenery and bundles of snakes, both small and gigantic. And you might wind up coming across little alien dudes, and this was a perfect placement for them. The game hasn't gone fully cosmic horror yet, but this is a great foreshadowing of it. If the shortcuts were actually short and not the length of an average level, I could have placed Forbidden Woods higher, but I really think they should have just put a second lamp here. Still though, it's a firm great tier area for me, always has been. I don't know what it is with the streaks of three back-to-back -back same game areas in this video. First Demon Souls, then Dark Souls, then Dark Souls 2 and now Bloodborne. But Old Yarnum belongs up here with the other two Bloodborne hits, so what do you want me to do? To me, Old Yarnum is the turning point in this game, in a sense. When you start the game, you're an outsider stuck in the middle of a hunt, and you're aimless and scared and nothing makes sense. It's more like you're just trying to survive. But when you enter Old Yarnum, you're no longer the prey, you're no longer running away. You're out there to hunt. And right off the bat, there's a guy telling you to piss off, hunters aren't welcome. And yet you proceed anyway and slaughter countless beasts in the abandoned streets and worn down buildings, and... It is glorious. All while this son of a bitch is trying to gun you down from a tower using a Gatling gun. This is a case of an area gimmick I don't mind. It helps give Old Yanam its own contained story, and I don't think it overstays its welcome. Though I do really hate fighting him and his saucepear friend. After that, the rest of this area turns into full-on horror. There's the hanging corpse of a blood-stuffed monstrosity inside a building filled with screeching infected beasts, and the dark streets at the bottom are home to jumpscare werewolves. Great thematic level but it doesn't quite reach the complexity of something like Central Yarnum or Cathedral Ward. I didn't want to end today's video with triple Bloodborne areas, so let's go with Hirata Estate instead, shall we? We normally don't get much of a sense of a lift in location with Souls Bornic Hero Ring areas. I can't really imagine the daily life of an Anno Londo resident, for example, even though that area is ranked higher for other reasons. But I like Hirata giving us a glimpse of a lift in human settlement, even if it is being raided and burned by bandits. There's so much detail everywhere. Gardens, wagons, boats, decorated houses, and the whole estate is surrounded by thick bamboo forests. It's wonderful. Well, I mean, it's a shame it's all being burned down, but, you know, I'm sure it was nice before that. It's also rare you get to kill enemies with a 100% clear conscience. Definitely not in Old Yanam, but in this case you're a hero for putting these raiders down. They're terrorizing the villagers, getting drunk, burning everything and scouring the buildings for loot. It's a really fun playground for combat. I love smashing people with the prosthetic axe, and this level encourages its use, and it fills me with a lot of joy. The first encounter with Juzo is also one of the better mini-bosses. 
It's just unfortunate he's reused so many times after. It's fun to charge into combat with this poor guy putting up a last stand and he usually winds up dying in the battle because he's tanking everything. What a top G. Like in many other Sekiro areas, you can make a second trip here near the end of the game. It's much more brief and forgettable than the others in my opinion, but at least it has the Ministry Ninjas, who are to this day my favorite non-boss enemies in the series. Well, I think this is a good point to wrap up the video and leave the rest. For the video of the best! Feel free to speculate in which order you think they'll come, and offer your own opinions. I always read the comments. So, I'll see you in the finale.